Hi, I'm Brent Stafford, and this is RegWatch by RegulatorWatch.com. Over the years, the U.S. vaping industry has faced one crisis after another, from the moral panic over teen vaping to the hysteria over the so-called vaping-related lung illness. While these specific crises delivered near-fatal blows, the worst damage may come from an endless supply of shoddy science attacking the efficacy, safety, and long-term viability of nicotine vaping products. Joining us today to discuss the ongoing issue of questionable science is Dr. Ariel Celia, a behavioral scientist at Penny Associates, a U.S.-based firm that provides consulting services on tobacco harm reduction to Juul Labs. Dr. Celia, thank you for joining us again on RugWatch. Thanks for having me back. Well, earlier this year, you joined us for a RegWatch on GFN.TV episode to talk insights on youth use. And I wanted to bring you back for a deeper dive into the science around vaping and to explore some of the murky issues involved and to talk specifically about U.S. regulatory environment. First off, tell us about where you work, Penny Associates. So Penny Associates has one side of the company that works on tobacco regulatory issues. And this started back uh, a while, a couple decades ago now, trying to make nicotine replacement therapy available over the counter. Um, so essentially making a safer nicotine product available and making it as easy to get as cigarettes. But there's a lot of parallels to today. Mike Russell famously said that people smoke for the nicotine, but die from the tar. And so the idea is that can we make a safer nicotine product available and have it not be more difficult to obtain than the cause of the disease, which is combustible cigarettes. Why is it that risk reduced products seem to be getting such a bum rap in the U.S.? I think it's because it's new and it scares a lot of people. I think, I think, uh, you know, I, I try not to attribute bad intentions to people. I think that people are genuinely concerned for public health. And when they see young people use these products in large quantities and just seeing the initial rise, which of, of course now has declined again, um, there, it did lead to concerns, but I think, um, uh, there's a risk of, losing the forest for the trees because we have to remember that cigarettes are easily available at any any convenience store most pharmacies and they're they're so easy for people to get um so by focusing all our efforts on um either restricting the use of alternative products or making it seem like uh, kind of overblowing the health effects that uh can lead to negative population level effects does public uh, health and tobacco control specifically in the U.S., have they overblown uh, the risks and harms around vaping? I see a lot of negative press in the media, and I, I don't think a single party is responsible for this. Um, it starts with some of the studies. It starts with funding agencies, priorities. Um, and then it also uh, ends with the media in some cases, not really acknowledging the limitations because bad news sells and, you know, it's, it spreads more quickly than a, a more positive story. Um, but yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of exaggeration of the risks without stepping back to say, well, how does it compare to conventional cigarettes or what would people be doing otherwise if, the, if they weren't using these products? Because in many cases, they'd still be smoking cigarettes. And I guess that does bring me to my next question is that, in your opinion, are U.S. regulators and officials in tobacco control at least treating nicotine vaping products fairly? I think there's there's pretty big discrepancies between how nicotine vaping products are being regulated and how conventional combustible cigarettes are being regulated. So if you look over the last two years, um, there really haven't been any new approvals. There's 23 products currently, uh, nicotine vaping products currently approved by the FDA. But meanwhile, there were something like 900 combustible cigarettes. And so uh, again, I, I kind of understand the concern about like, well, these are new products. Maybe there's health risks that we're not aware of. Um, but at the same time, you have to take a step back and ask, are, are we making these products more difficult to get than the more dangerous ones? And, and I think, unfortunately, um, that's the case that we're in. How big of a news is it with inside the tobacco control and academic circles, the fact that the FDA has approved nearly a thousand new cigarettes in this last couple of years and zero uh, vaping products? Yeah, well, it's, it's it's really frustrating because it seems like the bar is very high for these new products to 
come into the market. And um, there, you know, the, the FDA is saying that there's a lot of variation in, in these products, but I, I have to wonder, and I'm not a toxicologist, so I, I don't know the answer to this, but I have to wonder, well, let's take, what, what about the worst product? What about the worst nicotine vaping product out there? Is it more dangerous than cigarettes? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but I really think um, there's a case to be made for product standards so that we don't get lost in the weeds of evaluating each individual nicotine vaping product um, without losing without losing sight of you know how dangerous they are compared to combustibles. So in your mind, what should be the position that say the FDA should have when it comes to vaping and other safer nicotine products? So I, I can really only speak to behavior. I'm, I'm not gonna comment on you know their toxicology evaluation. So there, there's aspects of this that I'm just not qualified to evaluate. But I, I think in general, moving towards product standards would solve a lot of the issues that that we're facing because it's um it, it's pretty clear from the literature that on average e-cigarettes are at the low end of the continuum of risk. And so having some line in the sand to say, okay, anything less risky than this or more risky um, shouldn't get approved, but um, have it, you know, anything below that bar is probably appropriate for the protection of public health. I think it's important to flush that out a little bit because what the FDA is doing here with nicotine vaping products is much different than say what's going on in Europe with the tobacco products directive, the TPD, and the difference is product standard. So in Europe, they set some standards based on, you know, how the you know, top nicotine and some quality issues and so forth. But as long as you meet those standards, you can innovate and bring new products to market without the government involved at all. But here in the U.S., the FDA has got this, you know, blanket, you know, approach where they have to approve first or uh, they can't go on the market. And obviously that's not turned out so well. Yeah, I think it's if you look at the market right now, it's mostly unregulated. The the FDA is ramping up their enforcement efforts to get rid of some of the unregulated products, but um the fact remains that most of what's out there is unregulated right now. Um and I I think there's also uh some difficulty in in what I'm hearing, like I I haven't worked uh firsthand with this, but I think there is some difficulty in trying to prove to the FDA that this particular product and this flavor and this nicotine concentration um, is effective for the protection of public health because people use multiple products. It's it's really hard to to get that standard of evidence for one particular product. So I, I think having product standards would um, simplify the whole thing, and not and then it wouldn't take as long in theory to review individual applications. Dr. Califf, uh, who's the commissioner of the FDA. Uh, just recently in testimony uh, in Congress, was making the point over and over and over again that what's appropriate for the protection of public health is no teen use of any nicotine product. So if there looks like a vaping product is going to get picked up by a teen, th that immediately discounts it. And that includes all the flavors and so forth. So it's that issue in terms of attaching the teen use to a nicotine product that's preventing most of these products from getting approval. Yeah, so teen use is a concern. And in an ideal world, we wouldn't have any teenagers using nicotine products or any other substances. But the reality is they do. Um, if you look at the historic smoking rates among middle school and high school students that, that used to be over 20% 20 years ago, um, teen rates of marijuana use, uh, even well before it was legalized anywhere, that was high and consistently high too throughout uh, the different stages of legalization. So um, just because you have these regulations in place, it doesn't mean teenagers are never going to get their hands on these products. And it, I, I think it really should be a, a balance effect. The thing that concerned me about Caleb's testimony was that he seemed unaware of the 900 combustible products that were approved over the same time period. So again, I think it's falling into the trap of focusing too strongly on uh, one particular downside of vaping and not seeing the larger picture of adult smokers. In your opinion, is there war raging within public health over nicotine vapes and other safer nicotine products? In some ways, it does seem to be getting more polarized. Um, but at, at the on the other hand, I do see some evidence um, in recent conferences, for example, that it seems to be less 
controversial these days to embrace e-cigarettes for harm reduction among adult smokers. Um, the youth issue, of course, is still very controversial. Um, and there are some people that I, I think are overly focused on the negative implications of vaping and the potential negative effects. But I think um, I, I am seeing a bit of a shift, although it's still very polarized. What do you think is driving the division over this? I think there's a lot of reasons. I, I think a lot of it starts with uh, academic incentives. So starting with the uh, funding priorities of the funding agencies, um, and I, I can tell I can tell you as my personal experience coming from academia that at one point when I started looking at e-cigarettes, I was completely unaware of the harm reduction point of view. All I all I heard about was um, you know they're they're harmful for kids. They're a gateway to smoking. And um, as I talked about in the last interview, I changed my mind with my own research on that. But um, I, I think a lot of academics are still just unaware that there's another side to the story, especially in the U.S. I, I think in the U.K., the messaging is is a little more uh, aligned with the evidence. But in, in the U.S., there's just so much bad press that I think a lot of academics aren't aware and um, I can say my experience as a peer reviewer for papers, when, when I see a paper come through, uh, when I have time to review these days, um, sometimes I'll, my comments will be, well, I think this introduction presents a fairly unbalanced and biased side of the literature. And the, uh, in the revision, the reviewers will edit and they'll write back and say, oh, that wasn't our intention at all. I've added some balancing studies to, to kind of give a more balanced perspective. And um, I think that a lot of them, like I've had that experience enough times that I think they just genuinely weren't aware how biased they were coming across in the initial version. And maybe they hadn't heard that there's a harm reduction side of things. Well, we're going to dive in more on that bias issue. What's your assessment of the quality of science overall coming out on nicotine vaping products? It's it's a mix. There's there's a wide range, I would say. There are some really great studies coming out every week, but also some uh, very misleading ones. Um, I would say most of them are somewhere in the middle. It, it seems like there's, uh, in academic publishing, there's an incentive towards publishing more studies because that's how faculty members are evaluated. So a lot of the studies, uh, just in my opinion, don't add a lot. Like on one hand, it's important to have replication studies um, and prevent some of the replication crises that we've seen in other fields, like in psycho psychology, for example. So on, on one hand, it's important to have many similar kinds of studies, but on the other hand, most of them are all the same type of studies. And uh, Marcus Munafo has talked about this, that having more of the same type of evidence, like from uh, individual survey studies, doesn't really make us more confident in the findings because that has a particular that type of research has a particular bias. And it's good to triangulate across different types of research, um, like population level effects, maybe genetic uh, genetic studies. And each of these approaches has their own strengths and limitations, but it's about the consistency of evidence across different types of studies. And that's that's what I really think is lacking in a lot of the literature. I mentioned at the top of this episode that there's an endless supply of suspect science. Would you agree with that or am I the one that's being hysterical? There's definitely a lot of flawed studies out there. Um, there's similar studies coming out week after week. Uh, the last week literature batch that I reviewed had a lot on social media use and that's that's kind of one of the common flaws that I see these days. So. Uh, e-cigarette exposure on social media is associated with e-cigarette use or susceptibility to use. And uh, it, it's not that I'm saying that's impossible. It's, it's certainly possible that, you know, seeing e-cigarette content on social media can um, promote uh, usage of e-cigarettes. But I, what I don't see in these studies is acknowledging other possible explanations out there. So, for example, um, people who are already using e-cigarettes or are interested in using the products are more likely to pay attention to content and remember seeing the content. And these are all like self-report studies. So it's not, it's not measuring where was this person actually exposed? It's measuring, do you, do you remember seeing? So the, the paying attention to, and the remembering, um, there's a selection bias in there that might explain the association. And it gets even worse with social media because social media, it, you're not just a passive viewer of content out there in the way that you are with like mailed ads or television ads you have an active role in seeking out the kind of content that you like, and then the algorithm feeds you more of it. So that, that's a reverse causality explanation that could explain these results. 
And again, I'm not I'm not saying there's no association there, but um, these other factors need to be better considered. Dr. Selya, tell us about your work with Clive Bates, the legendary tobacco control policy expert. So Clive and I do an informal review of the new nicotine studies every week. So anything that appears on PubMed every week, there's between 30 and 70 new studies on nicotine. And uh, we we kind of look through that and uh, kind of grade it for what, what's a must read, what is uh, potentially damaging for you know misperceptions about e-cigarettes, for example, what are the strengths and flaws in the literature. So it's, it's a way of, uh, for myself, of keeping up with the literature and um, helping some other people uh, kind of understand and get a handle on everything coming out. Now that's uh, over a couple thousand papers to review each year. How does the team cope? We have to be selective sometimes um, on weeks when it's 60, 70 papers. Uh, you know, we, we can't do all of that every week. So we just have to pick and choose what, what do we think is worth focusing our efforts on. Because um, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of the studies are redundant. Um, every week I see a couple on uh, e-cigarette use in social media, uh, and they all have the same flaws. Every week I see a handful on risk factors of, of nicotine product use. And we know as a, as a scientific society, we pretty much know what the risk factors are. So it's on one hand, it's good that this is confirmatory, but like it's, it's a lot that uh, a lot of papers each week that don't necessarily bring new knowledge. So we have to be selective. Clive is a lot better at doing the bare bones summaries than I am. So typically I will start with the abstract. And sometimes I feel like I can get all the information just by quoting excerpts of the abstract. But other times I'll feel the need to read through the full text and see, well, how did they define this? And what other analyses did they do that might have not made it into the abstract? So is there a lot of junk science out there? Uh, th there is. Th there's some good science, but there's also some um, misleading science. And uh, I wanted to give you know researchers the benefit of the doubt. I don't think they're all ill-intentioned, although I do see a couple cases that um, that concern me where I think it's like a good news story if you look at the results in without looking at the narrative, but then it's spun in the narrative as a bad news story. And, and those do seem more um, dishonest to me. Well, we know from science that vaping can make your sperm count go down, your teeth fall out, your your hair turn gray. I mean, it's just it's kind of endless sometimes about the ridiculous things that the science is telling us about vaping. Yeah, and all all those health studies are most of them suffer from the same flaws, where which are you. It's a cross sectional survey, meaning that you ask people at the same point in time. Uh, do you have this health effect? And uh, do you, and th these are usually from large studies like like NHANES, for example, which asks about like every possible health condition and health behavior. So it's not th these are studies that are geared at um, measuring health effects of vaping. It's just kind of a cross sectional inventory of uh, health behaviors and and health effects, and then they'll correlate it with uh, vaping behavior at the time. But the common flaws here are that uh, it doesn't. Most of the studies don't take the effort of eliminating um, participants whose health effect happened before they started vaping. Um, so if, if somebody is if somebody had a heart attack five years before they started vaping, obviously vaping didn't cause the heart attack. Another common issue there is not accounting for smoking history. So, so they'll say, okay, e-cigarette users have a higher risk of heart attack than non-users, but then it, it doesn't really account for the fact that most e-cigarette smokers or most e-cigarette users had a history of smoking. And so it could be the smoking that caused the health effect instead of uh, the e-cigarette use. Is it ideological? Like, is it is it because the researchers suffer from a prohibitionist mentality? Do they have a problem with individual pleasure? What is it on that level? Yeah, I can't say for what's in, inside some people's minds, but it does seem like some people are opposed to nicotine use, uh, recreational nicotine use at all in general. And I think this is a big difference from the common attitudes towards um, alcohol use, ca caffeine in the morning, um, even recreational cannabis use. I think all of these are accepted substances by society. And um, I, I think in a lot of people's minds, nicotine is not in the same category. And I, I don't really, I'm still trying to understand the reasons why. Now, sometimes bias is institutional, isn't it? 
Yes, yes, it is. So I've experienced this firsthand as a faculty member. Um, as a junior faculty member, especially these days, you're under more and more pressure to get external funding. And typically in uh, social and behavioral research, this is from the NIH, and the NIH is, has certain funding priorities and they'll award uh, grants to the researchers that they think best meets those incentives. So there's a there's an incentive for faculty members just for their own survival to uh, to write grants that match the funding priorities of the funders. And then there's pressures around publishing, too, which I think contributes to some of the issues that we're seeing in the literature, because uh, you're it's really kind of just a you're evaluated as a on a tally. You're evaluated based on a tally of how many papers you publish each week. And the people evaluating you don't really have the expertise necessarily to say, oh, this is really groundbreaking or this is uh, what's called what some people call salami slicing, where you have you uh, publish on the least publishable unit of an analysis and uh, try to spread out across many publications to boost the CV. Tell us about this issue supplying indirects to the university. So the way grants work at universities is that the university has a set rate of extra uh, over on top of the award amount that they charge or that they ask from the funding agency to offset administrative costs. And uh, th this could be like, you know, electricity to the building and kind of operational costs, maybe staff that take care of uh, lab animals, for example. Um, that's that's how it's intentioned, but I think universities have become uh, more and more reliant on indirect costs to fund administrator salaries and just their general operating costs. So faculty members are, are being told you should get um, grants, but not just any grant, one that will pay the full indirect. Um, so some smaller profitable organizations, for example, uh, have a cap on what they would give as indirects, like say 10% instead of uh, 40, 30, 40, 50% in some cases. Um, and I was told as a junior faculty member that those, ground, those grants don't count because they don't supply the indirect cost to the university. So it really does come down to a financial incentive for the, and survival of the faculty member to be able to stay in that position. And then these, these indirect costs are um, that there's benefits to the university, but there's also benefits to the individual faculty members. So for example, you can buy your way out of teaching courses if you have enough grant support. And uh, this has led to like, I, I think this is a shame because the purpose of universities is for higher education, but there are some people that almost look down upon teaching because it means that you haven't been successful enough as a researcher to buy your way out of teaching. That's a really perverse incentive. Yeah, I, I think it's, I think it's problematic, and it, it, a lot of these incentive structures are uh, causing a lot of the issues that we're seeing with the research. So on indirect, where the university is getting, say, 30% on top of what the grant is, how is that not a kickback? They, they use it to offset operating costs, um, and <laughs> yeah, I, it's I, a I can't speak. It's, <laughs> I, I can't speak for the internal budgeting. Um, yeah. Well, and, and let's get down to right down to it here is that say like even like a Robert uh, Woods Johnson Foundation, their grants don't make the grade because their kickback to the university through indirects isn't large enough. So there really is only one player or, or one real player, and that's the NIH. So the federal government will not only provide the grant, but the kickback to the university and and really the universities prefer that NIH money. Yeah, that's that's right. And I, I can't say that every university is like this, but I, I've been at uh, multiple academic centers and um, the, this is a common thing from what I'm hearing. And, you know, talking to other people at different institutions as well, it seems to be a common expectation that it's the full indirect grants are the ones that are really highly valued. So this wouldn't be such a problem if the NIH would actually fund, you know, research that took a fair and balanced look at nicotine and nicotine vaping products, correct? Because they don't right now, do they? So I, I, I haven't looked at the NIH funding priorities lately. I, I do know that some people, some academics are successful at getting funding from NIH for 
uh, e-cigarettes and smoking cessation trials, for example. So some some people are doing it, and it's not it's not like a blanket policy by NIH. Um, but there, in my time at least, this is going back like ten years ago. It, it did seem like there was more emphasis on uh, well, what, what are the possible harms around e-cigarette use? It, it's part of the process is uh, like the the way the game is played among academic researchers is you get a you write a grant on what they want to fund you for you use the money to fund at least in part your next pilot study to be turned into a future grant application so it it is pretty common to do um it is pretty common to have the research that's actually done be different from what it was awarded to Dr. Celia, one of the major issues tobacco control has is with research funded by the tobacco industry. Historically, that was truly an issue, but is it still an issue today? It is in some places. Um, every journal has their own policy, and some of them are that they won't accept any submissions from any industry. Um, other places are they won't accept any submissions from producers of conventional cigarettes, but they will accept uh, non-combustible industry funding, although that's that's more and more of a gray area these days. Um, and some some places are don't have any restrictions at all. Uh, but it, even some in some places, even if they don't have an explicit policy, um, it seems like they're not favorable to that kind of research. Tell us a little bit about the controversy that Jewel had with a series of papers that you were involved in uh, that were published in Nicotine and Tobacco Research. So Nicotine and Tobacco Research is is one of the main journals for this field, if, if not the main one. It's a very rigorous journal. I've, um, I've published in it a couple times over the course of my career, and I'd, I'd love to be able to continue publishing in it because I think the work that we do uh, does need to get out to this audience. Um, the journal recently decided that uh, they will no longer accept uh, submissions by uh, tobacco by the commercial tobacco industry, and that does include Juul. But there was some good science that was done, was it not? It, in my opinion, it was good, but I'm I'm biased. Uh, we yeah we published a 24 month study of adult Juul purchasers. So uh, the caveat here is that we're, this is looking at current established smokers at baseline who purchase Juul. And uh, by virtue of the fact that they purchased Juul, they were probably already like fairly committed to using the product and liking it. So it might be uh, positively biased, but we did find a uh, fairly high switch rate. So 58% switched after two years uh, of, of Juul purchase, switched completely away from cigarettes. And that includes um, using neither product or uh, exclusively using e-cigarettes. We also did subgroup analyses by um, different racial, ethnic subgroups, as well as by whether or not somebody had mental health symptoms, um, by whether or not they had smoking-related illness, and the results were pretty consistent across all of the groups we looked at. Just qu quickly about the conclusions on this, uh, similar trends in switching and smoking reduction were observed across populations disproportionately affected by smoking. Yes, so there's a, a lot of focus right now on um, different on disadvantaged populations and the impact that cigarette smoking has had uh, because pr smoking prevalence is different across uh, in, in certain minorities and um, people in lower income groups and uh, people with mental health issues. Those are kind of the populations that tend to be more impacted by smoking. And so we found when we sliced it up that way, we found uh, that these switch trajectories were uh, pretty consistent regardless of all those characteristics. So even among the people that are disproportionately affected. And Dr. Celia, you also co-authored a paper in this one in 2022, looking for trends in sales data between electronic nicotine delivery systems and cigarette sales in the U.S. What did you learn? So from that study, we we did a uh, an actual versus counterfactual comparison uh, of cigarette sales. So we modeled cigarette sales, uh, which had a certain trend in 20, between 2014 and 2017. And we projected that forward to say, if cigarette sales trends had continued through 2020, what would they look like 
according to the pre-existing trajectory versus what do they actually look like? And there's a notable cigarette shortfall, and this correlates with end sales. And we also did some uh, follow-up econometric analyses where we we essentially found that the the two product this is consistent with the two products being substitutes, which we have a lot of other evidence for as well. So if if sales of one one product increase, then um, sales of the other product decrease in a way that there's an, a long-term equilibrium between the two products. And more interestingly, e-cigarette sales preceded the, the changes in cigarette sales, which is, it doesn't prove, but it's more consistent with e-cigarettes being the driver of these changes in the cigarette shortfall. So I, I think in the end, we found out that for each extra per capita e-cigarette product sold, there was a cigarette shortfall of 1.4 packs per capita. And th these numbers, th take these numbers with a large grain of salt because there's a lot of imprecision in um, the, these exact numbers. So the argument being is that if you were to say somehow through regulatory action to remove ENDS products from a particular area and so less were being sold, that could lead to more cigarettes being sold. Yes, it, it could. If the products are substitutes, which th this is one piece of evidence supporting that idea, then um, we definitely have to be careful about unintended consequences. Dr. Celia, let's switch back to policy, specifically the FDA. Many in the U.S. vaping and tobacco harm reduction community believe the FDA has enacted a de facto ban on nicotine vaping products. What do you think? I think it's a it's sort of a gray area. The FDA will say that they, there's no de facto ban. They they say that the expectations are clear, especially for flavored products, that they have to be superior to tobacco products. Um, I I think all in all, we have to take a step back and look at the overall market. Um, it it still seems like cigarettes, the more much more deadly product, are a lot more widely available. Um, with a, a lot more products, at least on the legal regulated market. So people can still access e-cigarette products that are unregulated, but that's a potential problem in and of itself. So I, I think the regulation should uh, account for this. Um, and again, I think this is an area where product standards would help. So Dr. Celia, we spoke about what is appropriate for the protection of public health already. Basically, the standard is if there is any chance teens may take up use of a safer nicotine product, it will not get approved. Now, is this narrow standard appropriate? And I mean, specifically considering that there's still millions of adults in America smoking. Yeah, so I, I think for the population health standard, you have to look at the entire population. And like you said, the majority of uh, of smokers are older adults, and those are the ones that are uh, imme at immediate risk of health harms if they don't quit combustible tobacco use. Let me ask you, you've just recently presented some research uh, to the Society for Research on Nicotine and Tobacco, which may shed some better light on this issue. Walk us through that. Yeah, so this was a collaboration with Dr. Carl Eric Lund in uh, the Norwegian Insti Institute of Public Health. And this is a sort of historical case study looking at what happens when a population shifts from combustible tobacco use to a lower risk alternative. And uh, this is the case of SNUS. So those two plots above show among men and women respectively, uh, tobacco, combustible tobacco use, which includes uh, conventional cigarettes and roll your own tobacco, um, decreased uh, and, and was replaced um, at least partially by snus, which are, are at the very low end of the continuum of risk. And um, this is a case study because I, I think it can inform some of the transitions that might be happening today. Uh, it's, it's more controversial today because uh, people are concerned about e-cigarettes. It's a new product, but a lot of the same concerns were raised about snus uh, back in the day, including uh, what if um, non-smokers and youth uptake these products? What about the long-term health effects, and none of those concerns really bore out. Um, like nicotine use didn't skyrocket at the population level. Uh, the long-term epidemiological data is very favorable towards snus compared to cigarettes. And so it, this is, I think, a case study that uh, we can look at to say, is the same pattern happening today? Um, there, there was a lot of concern about youth use, especially in um, which peaked in 2019 in the US, but it's declined by over 60% since then. So um, in, in my opinion, it was uh, a fad somewhat, 
Um, there's still youth that use these products. It's still the most common product, which is a problem, and we want to uh, reduce that. But then uh, cigarette smoking is at an all-time low. So one of the motivations for me doing this research was because I see this talking point about if you look at e-cigarette users, the proportion who have never smoked is increasing, especially in younger age groups. And that's interpreted as um, something concerning because it, and what it sounds pessimistic because it sounds like non-smokers are taking up these products. But really what's happening is that you have a shrinking denominator of people who smoke. So mathematically speaking, it's if you have a situation where you have displacement, it has to be the case that the proportion of users who are never smokers has to increase. Um, and so rather than being necessarily a bad thing, like it could be a bad thing if it adds to total nicotine use, but it could also be a favorable indicator of a population level shift away from combustible tobacco. And um, but my point in making that poster was to show that you, you really need to look at the population level trends when you're interpreting um, statistics like this. And there's also too how these things are measured. For as long as we've been covering this issue, I've been bothered by the way researchers measure vaping use. It's the 30 day measure. Tell us about this measure and what is wrong with it, if anything. So typically current use in youth is defined as any use, even a puff in the past 30 days. And this can include anything from like borrowing a friend's vape at a party one weekend to all the way up to daily use. And when you break it down by frequency, actually the, the largest group is using one to five days per month. Um, there are 40 something percent frequent users, meaning they use on 20 or more days out of the past 30 days. And um, that is concerning that it, that is something that um, shouldn't be happening among youth. But um, by having the definition be any use in the past 30 days, it does include a high proportion of experimental use. And then the other issue is uh, this is just one point in time. Um, so how many of those past 30 day users go on to use a year later? And we, we don't have a lot of data on that, but if, if you look at the cigarette smoking literature, like youth cigarette smoking using the same types of measures, the more you add on criteria that are often used in adults, such as like 100 cigarettes per lifetime. So if you look at youth that are using not only once in the past 30 days at one time point, but are they using the year the following year? Are they using frequently the following year? Have they uh, developed this lifetime established use? the numbers are uh, vanishingly small. So um, there's, yeah, there, there's a case to be made for uh, re-evaluating what measures we're using. Final question, Dr. Celia. If one were to hope for a paradigm shift within tobacco control science, would it be wise to turn to American philosopher of science, Thomas S. Kuhn, and his 1962 book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions? where he stated that, quote, scientific progress is not always linear or cumulative. Paradigm shifts often occur, not because scientists change their minds, but because the old generation of scientists passes away and the new generation grows up familiar with the new paradigm. So is that what we have to hope for? Is some of the older tobacco control scientists to just pass away? I think there is something to be said for the top people in the field sort of acting as gatekeepers. Um, I, I don't think that's the only way. I think there, there is other hope. So there's a lot of movement more towards post-publication criticism these days, uh, where critiques can be posted on a platform like PubPeer, and then uh, people that are paying attention can read about the uh, potential problems with the study. Um, there's also, I, I think, also, the, the, the quote about truths become first being vehemently objected and then ridiculed and then seen as self-evident. I do see some shift with that um, towards e-cigarettes being seen as kind of self-evident for harm reduction. So I, I have hope and that, that includes cleaning up uh, both sides of the literature, including the pro-THR side, which does have some issues sometimes too.